first things first, um, introduction, introductions real quick. Uh, my name is Sven, I'm from Cologne, Germany. I'm a fake black belt and a sister art of Jiu Jitsu, yeah. whatever. Um, yeah. For, for further information, just ask Preeti, you can probably explain it better than me. Um, and um, my goals for today, um, or my, my goal for today is the following. Um, I want to give you guys examples of how um, leg locks, or let's say leg entanglements, because we're not focusing on, on finishing leg locks too much, but rather getting into position to do so, um, how they are not a foreign body in jiu-jitsu. Um, for, for some reason, you, even though it's very evident, you still have to show people that, and um, those who are more reluctant to learn leg locks, or those who are just not good at them, um, tend to discredit them as something foreign, like a foreign body is a, a separate set of techniques or whatever within within Jiu Jitsu. Um, that's how it was in the beginning, actually, like when when the big leg lock hype and boom started. That's actually what it was. So that was the, the entire um, almost perfect system of Jiu Jitsu, and then there was leg locks, and there were very few connections between the two. And the more leg locks have been around, the more leg entanglements have been around, um, people caught up with it and people integrated it into jiu-jitsu. And I do believe that um, jiu-jitsu done right and pure and not interfered by with uh, rules and other man-made bullshit um, is inherently perfect and perfectly interconnected. Um, and it's just as natural to integrate leg locks with back takes, with chokes, with what we're going to today, uh, gonna do today with arm locks, as it is to integrate arm bars with triangles and normal platas and kimuras and back takes. There, there's no gaps in between those and it's the exact same thing for attacks of the lower body. Um, and there's no reason it shouldn't be. That's, some people still for some reason argue that and I still, I, I, I think it's, about, uh, it's out of ignorance. Um, and there's just no valid point you can make that for some reason there there should be a, a, a magic wall in jiu-jitsu below the hip. So uh, we're going to connect the far ends. And um, actually, there was a typo in the in the uh, class name. It's not leg locks and arm bars. It's leg locks and arm locks in in general. Um, because especially twisting arm locks are a pretty good segue um, into the legs. We are gonna, or, or I'm, I'm gonna just assume that you know a couple of positions. Um, we don't really have the time in this hour format to get too deeply into them. Um, it for sure helped if, you, um, if you've been to Dennis's class, Leg Locks Don't Work, uh, yesterday or the day before, I'm not sure. Uh, yesterday? Yeah. So if you've been to that class yesterday, there, there will be something familiar, and for those of you who play around with it anyways. Um, there will two. Um, Rose, okay, I use you. Oh, my leg. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 not I'm not finishing anything on the legs, uh, anyways. So, um, oftentimes, the, the accurate reaction to um, a leg or lower body attack to defend that will present the upper body. Because um, it's, it's pretty hard to defend everything at once, especially if you have an initial entry, uh, entry on someone. Um, so, the, the first thing we're going to start off from, it's probably connecting things you know from um, from different scenario, is we get into uh, a cross inside Ashi. Um, I don't care how you do that, but basically, um, for those of you who don't know, um, put your leg underneath his like you would for a leg drag, and bring the outside leg in. So that's it. Um, cross to the inside. Cross because his leg goes across my hip, inside because my feet are on the inside. What you, uh, I think, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, the, with Dennis was uh, the basic turning his kick. So the, the thing is, Raul has to hide his heel. Um, this is not a finishing position yet, but if I get uh, if I get a bite on the heel, that's when magic happens in the knees explode, right? Um, he doesn't want that probably, so he's going to turn to hide his heel. Um, now I can make a decision. I can either Hunt, uh, go for the heel, hunt it, chase it down, and 
reconnect, that's absolutely possible. I can turn and invert through, and I can switch position on the legs. But I can as well use the fact that he's turned away in posting. Um, so what I uh, want to do from here is attack the farthest end of his body, it's that arm, that shoulder over there. So I am going to uh, disconnect from him, let my, knees point, uh, my, my feet point in the same direction as his, and gain height on the hip. I'm turning away and coming up on the hip. So I'm currently sitting on the hip and he turned away, I'm behind his shoulder. Um, and again, now he can make decisions. He can abandon the escape, turn back into me and expose his leg on the way in. And I can see that I can reattack. Or you can just try and finish his escape. The, the post is not that much of a problem if he uh, does a trying to escape and post on my knee. Um, I will have to clear that, turn and come up myself. From here, all I do is gain height on the head, and there's my entry into the arm. Um, if you jump and roll for a kimura like that, don't care about the grip. Um, the grip is kind of, kind of a, um, a, a trap for yourself. If you go for the grip initially, it would be easier for him to escape. What you worry about is bringing your elbow as deep in as possible, like you're trying to elbow him in the face, basically. Don't, don't actually do that, uh, but bring your elbow in to the shoulder as tight as possible. Let's, uh, for, for a second, go over why. So we start from here, he does his turning escape, I prevent the post, come up, and this exposes his, his arm, but I get high on him. If I go for the grip, what happens is that my arm will be lower on his arm. So uh, all he has to do is free this elbow. Let's do it slowly. Yeah. Elbows up, I lost. I made a fool of myself. So, same thing. Here we go. Um, you try the same thing for your elbow. Now we go for it when I'm in position to keep the spine up. Okay. So you're just gonna do that, that setup first. It's the same thing you would uh, when you roll against uh, when roll for a kimura in from guard. So we start in our cross in Sadashi. I show him that I'm going for the heel yet to make him uh, turn for the escape. In coming up, I would get rid of the hand that my feet point in the other direction and gain height on the side. The arm is exposed, get height on the head, roll it, bring your elbow in deep, then you go back to your cross kimura or whatever you call it. Make sense? Why give it your hand on his head? Because um, if I don't get proper height, uh, height on the head, it can be in the way. So if he manages to bring his head in between, I'm too far away from the shoulder. So that's just, it's just, I'm just stuffing it and going straight over it. He can actually, you can pretty well defend Kimura and she's just by using your head and pushing him away from your arm. Okay? Give it a shot. I guess the, the, the problems that occur are pretty much uh, the same all over the board. So, um, a lot of, um, in general, following up on leg entries and following up on his escapes is anticipating his rotation. Because there's always rotation involved in a proper uh, heel hook or leg lock defense. And a lot of it is anticipating his rotation. And I either anticipate it to stop it all I uh, anticipated to kind of leap him and stop the rotation when, when I'm ready to stop. So when he starts facing away and this hand comes forward, I know he's going into a turning escape. Um, it absolutely makes sense and there's, there's nothing else he would do from that position um, that, that made sense. So as soon as he starts turning, I'll just turn with him and let my feet point to the outside and I'm shearing this knee into his hip. So, the moment I'm bringing my legs over there and my hand on the mat, I will come up and get height on the sit. And I'm shearing in a way that my, my father leg is at the height of his knee and my closer leg stays on his hip. Some of you did that a bit lower, so you went, didn't go hip and knee, but foot and knee. It's not bad either, it just usually leads into other follow-ups. So if he turns and I go lower like that, 
it will usually not give me the arm because as I uh, progress coming up, you will probably keep turning most of the time. And this will give you opportunities to get on top of that. Um, you might even get to, to the other knee to try and escape. So yeah, if he gets all the way up, this usually leads me into back and forward attacks or into back attacks. Um, not bad either, but I want to be able to block his rotation like one step earlier. And that's why I keep being attached to knee and hip. There. It's hard for him now to turn further than that because I'm putting this leg on a shelf just for a second. Also, by leaning into him, I mean by bringing my head over his, I'm making this arm very heavy and stationary. And now it's easy. Um, in that case, his head is low, low enough. He didn't post on the head, but only on the elbow, so it's relatively easy to just drop him uh, for my king arm. So that's like the, the, the key problem I saw. As soon as you see him start moving, the only thing you have to worry about prior to um, switching legs and coming up is clearing the post. But you can pretty much do that in one motion and then come up. It's just clear it upwards. That's usually the easiest part to clear that post. Okay, I guess it answers some of the questions you guys have. Okay, give it another shot, don't clap. <laughs> Arm locks are just one example here. Um, we pretty much in the, in the next thing we're going to do, we come, we're coming from the other side. But the exact same idea I can use for for different um, for different objectives. So his turning escape, you, you turn, you turn the escape. His turning escape gives me access to the arm. It also gives me access to the to the head, to the neck, and it can also, of course, give me access to the back. So um, just the, the proper reaction he does. Um, worst case, pretty much, if he doesn't pose or if his pose collapses and he falls to the shoulder, that still can give me access to the head, but it, is, it sure gives me top control, uh, top position, um, and, it, and an easy pass. So it's, there's different paths I can choose from there. Um, the, the key thing about it is anticipate that there's going to be a rotating escape coming sooner or later. If you see him starting to rotate, rotate with him and rotate a bit faster because he's kind of stuck you are way more free than him in your movement and just get on top let him turn i need mean, he's basically turning away from you presenting you uh, opportunities and he kind of has to open himself up to um, to make the escape happen um, so the threat of exploding me kind of gives you access to to a lot of other things um for the, we're going to pretty much do the the opposite side route and see how Attacks on the arm lead into the legs. There's a couple of things you can do. Um, I think the most common that people probably know of from guard, like omoplatas lead, can even lead into knee bar entries. Um, attacking the arms from butterfly will make him pull out so you can get under the hip. Um, so maybe we'll cover that in the end if we have some time for it. Um, I'd rather do it from, uh, from top position today. So we start in the half guard. Um, and use a passing scenario, probably um, most of you already know. It's um, a reverse uh, half guard base pass, or I think Lock and Jets call, calls a switch, ba uh, switch base passing. So I uh, have my knee winning the knee line, and from here we'll go into a switch base. Um, I will make sure that my bottom knee gets in front of his hip bone. If my knee is stuck on the floor and he gains height on my, on my leg, I'm actually in danger of uh, losing position or even um, if he gets too, too far underneath even having my back tack. And so the, yeah, also there, it, it, it's, it's annoying if that happens. So make sure that your kneecap is pushing into the inside of his hip bone. The hip bone you, you can always grab for, for wrestling or whatever. That's where you put your, knee, uh, your kneecap. So either do that while switching by slightly lifting your knee before you do so. So I'm on the hip bone now. I'm just li lifting above the hip bone and pushing it. And I'm also staying high on him. I don't want to sit on my ass. I want to sit on his shoulder um, if you're not particularly being nice or he deserved it. Or it's a competition, you can even slam your butt cheek into his face for a laugh. Don't do that. Yeah, I, not, not, nothing applies to you, of the things I've just said. Um, so 
we create a push and pull, we push our kneecap into his hip bone and we wander back on the other side and also get inside on the elbow to, to start our pass. Um, we pass pretty high and the, the more the tension rises, the easier it will get for me to step out and pass. So we get into this scenario, but I'll, I'll decide to not go for the pass. This could have several reasons. He could be too good at off-balancing me, um, maybe because he's used to, uh, to the kind of pass, or just maybe because he's bigger and stronger than me, which is, can be annoying in that scenario because I'm giving him uh, some of my weight. Um, or I, I just don't manage to open his legs enough with the push and pull because um, he's holding on too tight, so I can't free my knee line. What I can do, though, is now from the passing uh, scenario, drop my ass to the mat and bring my knee up all the way to the other hip. Um, as soon as he feels there's an opportunity to come up, usually the first thing that comes is the underhook, and I catch my kimura. I can still pass with the kimura, but because I kind of bailed on it and took my weight off him, I will uh, sometimes not be able to put him back to the ground. So what happens now usually is he's coming up and pushing into me. Pushing into me because he doesn't want to get ignored. And if I turn away from him, it's, it's hard to follow up. Let's get back. I don't have to free my legs. All I have to do is slide this knee uh, as high as possible and keep my foot on the inside while he's doing it. So come up again. That's all I want. At, a, at one point, he has to open his legs. And all I want now is my hip to not turn away from him. See how now my hip is turning away from him? My freed leg will make sure that my hip turns into him. I don't have to gain height. If I try to gain height too, I'll probably lose the battle. All I do is turn my knees and hips into him. As he proceeds to come up, I lean into the kimura and elevate. For the sweep. Let's do that first and then get into the leg attack. So, off guard, switch base. Drop to your ass, give him an opportunity to come up with an underhook, lock it, turn into it. Let him come up, use the kimura to sweep them, get him a second push. One, two, turn. Drop. Two more. Hip into him. Look at the back of his head. Come up with the kimura. Okay. Do that. Get an inside, like a cross side butterfly hook. Turn into him. Look at the back of his head. Turn him over. Follow up on the kimura. We get back into legs right after this one. Go. A little bit on, on uh, terminology, because uh, that's actually something that's very common as leg entry. And I can show off my really bad Japanese and judo pronunciations. Uh, what we just did, the kind of sweep we did, using this sideways or outside butterfly hook, um, it's called a yoko sumigayashi. Um, your regular butterfly sweep, that one, is a sumigayashi. So you use a butterfly hook on the same side. It will be that one here. So this one. It's a regular sumigashi. Uh, my, my hook stays on the side where it's usually at the butterfly. This one we just did is sideways on the other side. So this is the yoko sumigashi. Maybe some of you know that as a counter to a single leg. Um, you can do it as a single leg counter. Um, or you, I think it's a bit more common in the gi because it's like a, a classic judo technique and there's more grip setups you can do. Um, so we are using uh, a kimura assisted Yoko Sumigashi to, to sweep him over and follow up in the kimura. Um, we just talked about earlier how usually um, he knows there's a kimura for that. Um, this grip is pretty telling. So he will probably try and push into me and bring me over to the side I have the grip on. Go head over head, escape the kimura, even take my back. Um, this is the part about it that I actually have to defend. I cannot have my knees and hips and shoulders pointed that direction. So this leg 
will help me turn into. And I look at the back of his head, so he will not easily manage to, to push into me. He will still try it because he doesn't want to get swept. This gives me elevation and access to the foreleg. For a second here, I have control over the elbow and the knee, like the furthest, pretty much the furthest points of the body, and it's hard for him to um, manage that position. Um, I do that at what I call like the zero gravity point. It's like if you, if you have those, those planes where you can do zero G flights in, the highest point where there's actually no gravity, that's kind of the, the idea I'm aiming for. So those Sumigashi sweeps have a zero gravity point where he just is absolutely weightless because he's perfectly above my hip. That's the, that's the point I'm aiming for. So, uh, come up again, move. There. See how his hip is pretty much exactly over mine? He does not have any gravity here. I reach for the far leg, bring that one through, and go for my uh, basic Kani Mazami entry into the leg. And the funny thing is, even though I don't have control over the second leg, initially he cannot turn as long as I'm attached to the arm. So he can't, right now he cannot turn away from me, he cannot go into his turning escape, and I have a window of opportunity to seize the heel before he does so and get into my finish. If I lose the arm, I'll attach myself to the second leg because this just magically swings towards me. Okay, so we've all been to this point right here, he's coming up. I make sure to keep turning into him. At this point, yeah, he doesn't want to get swept, so he's trying to keep his shoulder and head high, and I cannot imagine, uh, manage to, to push him down. So I'd rather let him run into me to defend the Kimura and elevate. Now I'm actually on my far shoulder and I'm letting him get into me, I, because I'm not, no longer going for the Kimura. At the zero gravity point, I release my wrist grip, and pull myself underneath. If I lose the arm, I'll attach myself to the second leg, and fight my heel here. Can go right into my finish. Those of you who know how to finish a heel can can just go straight into the finish. I think it's a um, it's a good um, practice from those those kind of entries to follow up straight into your finish because people just get too good at defending uh, cross inside ashi, and you don't really have time here. If you have the heel, fall straight into your finish. Do you want to see from the outside too? Yes, please. Uh, where was you? Where was you? Okay. Ah, oh, there you go. Okay. Oh. Then get he's coming up. Turn into me. He's pushing into me. If he doesn't push into me, if he stays out there, I will not like, try and pull him, pull him in the force. So, yeah, we have to keep up. So it's all, all fine and dandy. Go back. Just come up and see. Yes. If he doesn't want to get Kimura, oh, there you go. Who managed to roll through? Doesn't really matter. <clears throat> For those of you um, who are too afraid of, of uh, if, if I have to say again, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you're if you're kind of afraid about heel hooks, this also is an entry into an e-bar. If you turn just slightly further. Um, but use the present set actually because it's kind of what we took off in the beginning. Alright? Go! Questions and problems up until this point. Let me hear them. So you all did it perfectly? No. <laughs> show me. Or show us. Yeah, okay, you okay? Yeah. Yeah, uh, bring it into the center so everyone sees it. This is not about humiliation, just so you. <laughs> right. I mean, okay. Well, partly, but. 40, 60. Right. People can learn from my uh, bad you didn't do. But it's here, it's too high up. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's actually not too high. The angle is just a bit off. Uh, let me do it to you. So, um, what you did was when you started elevating him, you um, put your hips square on the mat. You, you lay like that. Um, so, whoop. 
he came in, and you were here and brought him up. And that's kind of why the angle is weird and he's falling off. And, okay. and you have the, the, the feeling he's too high. He's not, he's not too high. Um, and for the sweep, that's fine, by the way. But if you want to answer the legs, I will ele elevate him uh, laying on my side. So as he comes up into me, see how I'm still on my side. I'm still on my right hip on my right shoulder. If I turned, this would happen. The thing that just happened to you. Yeah. If I turn, now that's kind of weird. So I'm st staying on my side. By staying on my side and pulling my knee in, this gives me access to catch the far knee. Okay. I want to catch the knee and bring my knee in towards my foot, higher than his knee, in behind the, the back of his knee. And from there, it's easy to follow up on, catch the second leg, or whatever, or turn him over. Does that answer Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You're on, just to clarify the same question, you're on your side, like facing your partner. No. I'm on the side, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at him, I'm like facing him. Yeah, because you well, said not to let that happen when we practice the... When you... Uh, he's, I said not to let that happen if you want to follow up with Kimura. Yeah. Okay. That's, his, that's his, pro, his appropriate reaction to defend the Kimura is to put weight on my shoulder. So, I cannot finish Kimura when I'm laying here. I can finish my sweep and catch the leg here. That's where they kind of interconnect and again they cover their bases. So, in the first example we had, the appropriate turning escape it's an appropriate escape to the, to the leg entanglement, will present you the shoulder. The appropriate reaction to the, the attack on the shoulder is what gives me an opportunity to elevate and get into the legs. So you can't, it's very hard for him to cover both of those. Um, more question on that? And use the opportunity. Ask him. So everyone else is perfect. Fall, falling into the knee bar most often than the yeah, the, um, that's like a, a general like, entanglement question, basically. So the difference between uh, the cross inside ashi we were going for and the reverse ashi, that's the, the one you need for the knee bar, is just the position of your own knee. So let me uh, show that from here. Um, the position of this knee is what determines the difference. This is a cross inside ashi. As soon as my knee crosses his hip line, this is a reverse ashi. Th that's everything. So you can basically turn all your knee bar entries into cross inside ashi entries by just not giving up the knee behind the hip. So uh, reverse ashi, cross inside ashi, just the position of the knee. Um, it's fairly easy to see there. It's a bit harder to manage on elevation. So if we do it in elevation, if uh, yeah, so it's this knee position. Yeah, it's this knee again. If I catch it and my knee stays on my side of his hip, and I close, we go for our inside ashi. If, um, and sometimes it happens when he ele you elevate him way more than you intended to, then you have more space to turn. If, at any point, this knee gets through, that's where we go into uh, reverse ashi and the knee bar. Um, either don't put your knee through, don't push your knee through his hip, keep this tight and use the outside leg to turn, or if you get there, uh, try and open up some space and get your knee back to the inside. And that's when you get back to your cross inside. That's it. That's the only distinguishing feature there. And uh, ideally, aim for the cross inside ashi first because the control is a bit better and it's better to control rotation and the, the inside heel look is a more powerful attack than the knee bar. Um, and switch to a knee bar after rather than starting with a slightly, slightly weaker position. Questions? Anything more? Yeah, how do you manage to, because if you keep the elbow, yeah. it has no chance to turn. If you have the elbow yeah. heel, uh, yeah. I'm having trouble with that. I kind of lose the elbow. So how do you manage to keep the elbow? Forward? By still keeping the elbow tied towards me and pulling it into you. The, the same thing I did on the, uh, on the jump over or, or rolling into entry is clamp on the elbow. Um, actually, on, on a Kimura, this, uh, we kind of emphasize the grip. Um, for control, I don't care about the grip. It's actually sometimes worse. So the the arm that comes in underneath the armpit, that's a controlling arm for the, for the Kimura attack. You need a grip to finish it. You need some control of the wrist to finish it. But for control, you, all you need is having your elbow wrapped tightly around your opponent's shoulder. The, the more, the better. Um, so it's, it's 
also very analog to the control on, the, on the, your leg when you attach yourself to the hips by pulling back into them. Um, so it's basically that. And if you feel that loosening up, catch the second leg so to keep them from turning away there. Okay. Um, before we get to, um, I can go over the time because we started too late. Uh, before we get back into um, and into the topic from a defensive standpoint, and we defend the leg entanglement with an, with an arm attack, um, those of you for whom that worked pretty well, play around between those two things. So make, make, it, a, make it a full sequence. So start with what we just did. There we go. We go into a turning escape. Ooh, I'm going back. Okay? It's just putting the pieces together. Um, make, make it a fun surf with his body weight. So you're going from balancing his body weight to balancing your body weight on him. And you're going from arm, leg to arm again. Okay? Play around with it a bit. Um, again, on this one, the, this is just one technique to kind of showcase my overall goal for the class. Uh, again, the overall goal is that even something that maybe still to some of you may, might be something foreign or feel, feel strange, it's, it can be perfectly incorporated into Jiu-Jitsu. And ideally, um, next to just learning a new technique, which is nice, but... Um, fairly um, benign step in learning jiu-jitsu. Um, maybe one or two of you had the realization like, oh, this actually connects pretty smoothly. And this is kind of the thing I was going for. Um, all that stuff, leg locks, they are not a foreign body in jiu-jitsu. And it's, I, I believe, and that's my overarching theory, that's with everything in jiu-jitsu. If there's something that you, that you have the feeling doesn't connect well. It's not down to the thing or a, a, a flaw in the matrix. You probably just didn't understand it yet, uh, or you didn't find the right connections. Or you do. You are doing something wrong. Uh, there's nothing wrong with with a set of techniques. Usually, I do believe inherently that jiu-jitsu is a perfect system, and that oftentimes um, we just mess it up by, by rules artificially changing it. That's what IBJJF did for what felt like centuries with leg locks. That's why they feel foreign. Um, but it's, it's artificial outside change. So this is pretty much the key thing. You can't integrate jiu-jitsu perfectly. It's, we just mess it up all the time. Um, and this extends to, I also think that doing jiu-jitsu correctly is, is usually the, the way to not get injured unnecessarily. Oftentimes, if you injure yourself, you did something wrong, probably. You, you, you shouldn't injure yourself on proper technique. It's just we mess something up because we force it or because we, we are under pressure of competition and we willingly throw caution out of the window or it's falling body weight that's, that's very hard to control or something or, or uh, another training partner. But I do think that jiu-jitsu just integrates um, technically and even like, with the human body. Um, last set for today, um, just to kind of round the whole thing out, um, let's use an, an arm lock attempt to get out of a leg entanglement. So we use our regular ashi, just your, your, your regular straight ashi. Um, by him trying to do anything with my foot, he has to bring his arms kind of in reach. And it doesn't really matter if it's him going for an ankle lock. Um, or if it is him going for a heel hook or just for control over my leg or controlling my knee, controlling my knee line. I usually get access to this elbow. Um, and it's one thing to pull on it, to relieve weight from my foot, to turn, to get into, into my escapes, to be able to put pressure on the foot, yada, 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 all this and that. Um, but I can also use the the grip on the arm and the rotation I'm actually using to hiding my heel. So I want to rotate that way to again hide my heel. That's what we had earlier in um, things you, you did in Dennis's class, if I'm right. Um, 
I'll use the same rotation just to transfer my body rotation onto his arm. So what I'll do is I get a firm grip on the arm, pull it in, and lock a figure of four. Actually, a reverse figure of four. So I have control over the elbow now, and I lean into that grip. This relieves pressure from my foot. So it's, it's hard for him not to keep proper control of my foot. I basically can't anchor off me because he couldn't use his upper body properly. And I keep turning into the thing until my shoulder hits the mat. Now my outside foot is light enough to come into his head. From there, my foot will keep enforcing the rotation. And I get height over his, over his uh, shoulder. I keep my foot on the hip to extend and turn into until I can bring my knee over his shoulder. So only if I can find, can find a way for my knee to get over his shoulder, that's when I release my foot from the, uh, from the hip. From here, I can turn him through. If he stops here, I can get my finish here, close to it. If not, I can turn it through and either finish on the, on the rotation or finish on, your, on, the, on the arm bar. So, regular action. That's my target. I want to target that arm and I want to rotate. So, reach in for the thing. Pull myself in, get on top of it. I don't, I don't care for the foot. You can't clear that before. You don't have to. If you're having a bit of trouble with it, clear the foot, sit on top of it. Then basically do the same thing, but I don't really mind. So, keep this in. My elbows and my shoulders rotate. My foot rotates too. My foot is still hit. My uh, shoulder hit the mat. Enough space for my foot to enter and step onto his hip. Turn, keep that turning. I clear his knee. Get my finish here, or turn through. To go for fun little arm bars. Can you see from the outside? Yeah. You can see the arm bar from the outside. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, so I'm in trouble now. This is all I'm aiming for. Point that my foot is safe. I can still turn in, ballerina toe, all oh, this and that. Turn, 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 poop. Shoulder hit the mat. There's my step. Use that to clear his knee. Keep turning. If, I, if he's stuck here, if he doesn't in, initiate the roll and puts his forehead on the mat, there's my finish. If he does, roll him through. Pummel from my pillow armbar. Either finish with a rotation or finish with armbar. Basically, this is what keeps him. And the other foot can just like I put this here. Or I can go. Fully over. The fun thing is it also kills a hitchhiker. <laughs> it's, it, it's a good thing to do in competition. Or, or with some kid on an open mat. <laughs> okay? Try. Don't clap. have time for uh, a final set of questions on the last technique but again um, the, the key idea is the integration again um, leg locks are just another thing in jiu-jitsu they present opportunities and they um, pretty much mix them perfectly one one little thing that I saw here and there that is has nothing to do really with the topic whenever you turn with something like this armbar or you roll with um, with an ashigurami make sure that the side of your head never touches the mat and there's never weight beyond your horns. You know, imagine where your, where your horns would be if, if you'd be me. Never have pressure outside of those. So the, like the head bot part of your head, this is the one you want to put pressure on. So as soon as you start the turn, this never happens. As soon as you feel the mat coming, um, use like Preet's hawking stuff. Look into the mat actively. I can come up on this. That's not a problem. I wouldn't want to do that here. That kind of sucks. Same goes for right direction, but to extend it. 
you don't want to use your nose. Uh, not only because it looks fucking stupid and you don't want people to take pictures and videos of you doing that and that you, they are not good for Instagram. Um, because as soon as your nose touches the mat, what happens on the turn is you will extend and lose whatever you hold on to. When you use your forehead, you can stay way more tight to whatever you're holding on to. So you're usually using grips when either your nose touches it, because this flattens you out in the roll, and don't use the side of a head, because you will not be able to hold the pressure, you will have to use a hand to assist, a hand you could use for other things way better. Okay, um, I hope, uh, even though we kind of started too late, and we, we ended too late, and whatnot, and whatnot that uh, you enjoyed this class. I will have another class on, I think it's Friday, on aggressive open guard, that mixes in pretty well with the stuff Jorgen did and the stuff uh, Yarni did. It's also pretty overarching conceptually. Um, I'm, I don't really care about the techniques I use, it's more, especially with those Globetrotter classes that are just an hour, it's about the basic ideas behind those and I just use technique to kind of showcase them. So, uh, thank you for turning out and skipping the, the tourist tour for this class and uh, let's take a final picture. Thank you. <laughs>